girls on the front row. We couldn't come back from Disney without some Pez. And of course, <laughs> I got it. <laughs> Here you go. One more nano. You can't walk away empty handed. All right. God bless you. Hey, Andrew, you out there? I heard him. Hi, Drew. I love my son. Kids say the darndest things, don't they? I was away in a retreat over winter break, and I was in Washington State, and I called up, and my wife said, your son is asking questions about God. And I'm like, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And she says, you don't understand. He wants to know where God is, and he's mad. And I go, well, why is, <laughs> why is he mad? He goes, I want to play with him. I want to play with him. And he said something else, but I can't say it in chapel. But it was really funny. Ask me on the side, because I don't want to get this on record on tape or I'll lose my job. Uh, you know, Jesus said that he has hid these things from the wise and prudent, but he's revealed them to children. And some of the most incredible words from God have come to my life through the conduit of children. I'll never forget when I was working uh, at a thing called the CMC at, uh, I think you got the monitors really high. I'm getting feedback on that. The uh, CMC, the Children's Missions Fellowship, I was at Central Bible College, there were children, we realized that there are children that were immediately going to go into the mission field, and the parents were getting prepared in cross-cultural communication and all those things, and we said, you know what, we really need to help these children, so we started this, this initiative, and, or enhanced the initiative that was already there to prepare kids for cross-cultural communication, and uh, I'll never forget, it was the week I was to leave, I was coming to Providence, in fact, to work in the city, I had no place to live, I had no money, no job, no nothing, how many of you can identify with that, and so, but you don't have to, because you can meet in the cafeteria today with Pastor Ogden and talk with him, and you're a nut, you're out of your mind if you're going to wait around for something to fall from heaven, be proactive, make sure you're at that meeting, if you have a heart for New York, if you have a heart for youth, make sure you go and you spend some time and at least hear what, what he has to say. And so I was already on my way to Providence. I didn't know what I was going to do. And this little girl comes up to me. I'll never, I'll never forget this. She goes, Pastor Paul, where are you going to live? And I was like, I don't know. And she goes, so in her childlike way, the same way that a puppy needs a puppy house, you need a house to live in? And I go, yeah. So she all of a sudden says, let's pray. And she begins to pray, and she says, Lord, I pray that Pastor Paul, the same way a puppy needs a puppy house, that he would have a home. Amen. And I walked away, and two months later, when I walked in to a place called the House of Hope, our church built, bought a three-story building that needed complete renovation, and that was my condition to live in there, that I renovated it. I walked in. Two minutes before I, uh, I, we were there, all of a sudden, a puppy out of nowhere runs and starts running around my legs. I never saw that puppy since. No, I don't believe it was a manifestation of God. <laughs> it was a puppy. But I will never forget what God clearly spoke to my heart and said, the only reason you're walking into a place to live here, Paul, is because I heard that little girl's prayer. I have hid these things from the wise and prudent, but it was God's delight to reveal them to the children. We, we don't give children as much credit, I think, as they deserve. Children are very important. As you saw, most everyone in this room, we could repeat what Joseph did in here in a pastor's meeting and have every pastor who came to Christ between the ages of 4 and 14, and you would see the same result over and over and over again. That means that 84% of your success rate is in the realm of children. And my question is, is why is it, if it is, it is such a high success rate and it is so important to the heart of God, why is it not important to us as ministers? I come here this morning not to talk to you about children's ministry and balloons and clowns to freak you out and all that kind of fun stuff and play some games because that is what we do when we work with kids. We, we reach on that level. But I come here to open your eyes internationally. And I come here because I realize my audience here today are those that are going to set the budget for their church. And I believe with all of my heart, if you leave this place and you take the position of a pastorate and your money and your mission does not encompass not only your children locally, but globally, you're missing it. You're missing a tremendous opportunity to reap a harvest. Listen to these statistics, and George Barna has really done a phenomenal job at bringing to light 
many of the truths of why children are important. First of all, they're important developmentally. Did you know 90% 90 of your brain, 85% of your psyche, and almost all of your morals are in place by age 13, but Barna actually says it's more like age nine. That evangelistically, every other face in the world is a child, and 1.2 billion of them are at life-threatening risk. That 84% of our conversions take place between the 414 window. That if you were to line up 10 believers, 8 out of 10 of them would be able to say that they came to Christ before the age of 14. And yet Barna shows us that 74% of pastors feel that they're doing a good job spiritually forming children. That most parents, above 90% of them, feel that the church is doing a great job spiritually raising their children. And yet 93% of parents feel that they are unable the people who are responsible for the forming of their children, the institution that should be training them to spiritually form their children and make it important are not doing the job. How are we doing in this? Barna came to find that only 1% of our children seem to have a world, biblical worldview. That two out of three of our pastors say that kids are doing a great job sharing Jesus with their friends and yet two out of three children in the world are unreached. And that the church spends an average of only 15% on children, a group that represents 50% of our target audience and 84% of our evangelistic success rate, and we only give 15%. We could do better. We could do better. Where are the Moody's and the Spurgeons? You want to claim him for your preaching? That's fine. Take him for your homiletics. But he's mine, and they're mine for children's ministry. D.L. Moody, before he was known as the great evangelist, was a children's minister. He started at a church and would go through the neighborhood giving out candy and would come to the church with so many children, they didn't know what to do with it, so they eventually put a lock and chain on the door and told him he couldn't bring him in anymore. He was the one that started the YMCA that you have, the Young Men's Christian Association and the YWCA, the Young Women's Christian Association, for the purpose of giving a place where kids could come together not only to exercise and shoot hoops, but to hear about Jesus. He was a children's minister at heart. C.H. Spurgeon, who was called the Prince of Preachers, you could take him for your homiletics all you want, but he's mine for a children's minister because he was the number one advocate for orphanages in England at a time when there was a childhood crisis. He walked up one day and he needed a building. He knew there were kids uh, dying on the streets and he saw a building and he went up to the realtor that was representing it and he says, I want to buy that building. And they said, you can't buy that building. How much? How much do you want for it? He goes, I'll give you a dollar. The guy goes, he goes, you're out of your mind. He goes, get out of here. Get out. He practically beat him out the door. He goes, get out of here. And he turned around. He stopped the door. He said, young man, he says, don't you mock me. I'm going to have that building for a dollar. And he turned and he walked out. That day, the owner of the building spoke to his agent. And he said, so, do you have any offers today? He says, nah, no offers. And then he starts laughing. He goes, what? What are you laughing about? He goes, well, we actually had one offer. And he, and he says, but it wasn't even an offer. And the guy goes, he goes, what did, what did he offer? He says, oh, a dollar. And so the owner starts laughing, and they're cracking up. And he goes, he goes, by the way, who was this guy that offered you a dollar for the building? He goes, oh, some guy called C.H. Spurgeon. He goes, C.H. what? He goes, C.H. Spurgeon. He goes, give him, it, give him the building for a dollar. He goes, are you out of your mind? He says, give it to him for a buck, or he's going to get it for nothing. <laughs> and he got it for a dollar. And he said this in one of his writings. He says, I'm perplexed. I'm confused. I don't know what to do. Do I dedicate my life to preaching and proclaiming God's world to a group of people who have already fashioned and fixed their decision-making values for the rest of their life? Or do I choose to shape the next generation? This is C.H. Spurgeon. No, sorry, I'm taking them back from you. You can't have them. D.L. Moody, great evangelist, but he's mine. And he's yours. And he's ours. Our example of people who were in places of importance, senior pastors, you are in that place for a purpose and a position not to provide yourself with luxury, not to provide yourself with an ever-increasing salary and trips around the world. You are there to empower the church to make a difference in it. And you are there to make sure that the budget is equally distributed to the need and the cause and the success rate and the furtherance of the gospel. I want to talk to you today and shift your heart from local to global in this brief time that we have here. I don't want to talk about kids in children's church alone, although they're there and they're part of these statistics that you'll see, but I want to step you back and look at the world 
and so many of the problems that are out there. First one I want to talk to you about is neglect and abandonment. When you look at the world around you, you cannot close your eyes to the truth. In our day where we can hop on a plane and be halfway around the world, we can write a check and make a difference, we can dedicate our lives and go to make an impact without looking at the fact of neglect and abandonment. Isaiah 49, 15 says this, can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on her son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. Even a parent will forget a child and leave them on the street. But God says, I don't forget them. I'll never forget talking about abandonment. My niece and my nephew, my nephew who we've prayed for in here, took a knife and stabbed his stepmother in the arm. Did he just wake up one day and become that? No, because when he was a little kid, one day his mom left and she never came back. Dropped them off at a shelter. Said mom has to live another life. Left him, took off with another woman and left an imprint on this kid's life that produced the problem. I'll never forget being working in the, in, uh, with the Dream Center in Los Angeles, California, being out in the morning, three in the morning with a guy by the name of Crystal Clayton, who is one of my heroes, man, just goes out into the streets all through the night picking up street rats. Kids, you see, they, when they run away from home, they think they can go to Hollywood and become a star, but instead they become a statistic on the street. And he is about bringing those kids off of the street and into the kingdom of God. But I'll never forget sitting there and watching a woman at 3 in the morning trying to sell herself with a group of about 20 other guys around her while across the street is a little 3-year-old girl walking in circles who belong to her. And that's just in the States. Let's talk about the hundreds of thousands of children living on the street right now as we sit in here and lift our hands and praise the Lord. Let's talk about Brazil policemen who get a $50 commission for capping off a street kid because they take care of the population problem. Let's not stop there, but let's go to Russia and talk about an orphanage where kids get one meal and one diaper change a day. Or we could go to Romania when the, the dictator Ceausescu was booted out and they found children in cages days at end without diapers, without changes. And this is the world of 1.2 billion children every single day. An audience that represents 84% of your chance to bring in a harvest. My friends, don't learn hermeneutics, learn homiletics, learn preaching. But man, learn the truth about the world around you and make a difference. Because you are being in this room, I know my audience, I know my audience. You are going to be the ones that are going to either solve the problem or not solve it. You are going to be the ones that are going to be in that position and be in that place of power to make a difference. Amen. You're the ones. And God wants so much for you to have his heartbeat for the children, not just for balloons and clowns and VBS, but for these children who face another problem of starvation and disease. Matthew 25, 35 reads this, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. Lord, when did I do that? When? Oh, you didn't see me? When you did it to that least of these? That was actually me. How much do you love Jesus? You love Jesus as the most least likely individual in your life. For if we claim to say that we love God who we can't see and hate our neighbor or ignore our neighbor who we can't see, we lie and the truth is not within us. And God wants to open your eyes, friends, this morning to the black horse of the apocalypse called famine and behind him rides a pale horse called death. St. Francis one time approached the Pope and the Pope said to him with a smile, Francis, no longer can the church say silver and gold, have I none, to which St. Francis replied, and neither can it say such as I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus, rise and walk. Sometimes our affluency is our curse, unless we let it be tempered by the burden and the heart of God. It gives new meaning to 1 Kings 17, where the mother was starving to death, and she told Elijah, I'm just going to cook this last piece of cake, and then me and my kid are going to die. That's reality around the word today. Who said that social action can't change the world? I know that it's about the gospel, but whoever saw and said that social action couldn't change the world never heard of Abraham Lincoln, never heard of Martin Luther King Jr., and certainly didn't hear about Jason Russell, Bobby Bailey, or Lauren Poole, who had recently gone into the country of Uganda and filmed a film called Invisible Children. 
When they went in, they saw and their eyes were open to the fact that there are children, soldiers, and war, which is the next thing I want to show you. Right now around the world, there are over 300,000 children fighting in wars around the world. I want to take a quick look at a video clip from this. And I will say that it's graphic, but my hope for you is, is that you wouldn't turn your eye to the side, but that you'd keep them wide open to the reality of what not only 400,000 children live out, but the people that they terrorize with with war. tried to understand this war, the more complicated it became. The complication begins with how many children are abducted and what usually happens to them once they are taken by the rebels. When they get to the bush, the first few things they are taught to do is to kill. And that is it, is to kill, go and harass somebody, you know, like killing using a, a knife, you know, beating, shooting, whatever, that is all they do. Nobody joins that, that fighting force voluntarily. They conscript people into the, the rebel ranks. They come, abduct children. They are seeking out children who are going to be the most moldable and the most easy to brainwash essentially into being a soldier and in that regard the child of, of 8 to 14 years is the perfect candidate. It, it is awful if I tell you that when they come to attack you can even wonder that these are children but these are fighters they are fighting. They're brutal. They are brutal. They have been trained they know how to fight. They have been brainwashed, they can kill, they can do awful things. Many children have been killed in front, of, in front of their eyes. They are being told, the moment you try to escape, we shall also kill you the same way we have killed this one. So now, when we send you to work, you must make sure you go and kill 20, 20 people, kill 30 people, kill 40 people. You are brutally murdered for other abductees. There is a lot of horror pushed into these children that they even fear to escape instead of being tortured and killed brutally like the other one who tried to escape or rather remain in the rebel ranks. And thousands and thousands of people, oh, 50,000 people have been ab ab abducted since, but many are not counted on the statistics. Because they get abducted in the villages, we don't have them on, on, on statistics, but you just hear abduction. What is taking place here really is very grave, except the world doesn't know. It's extremely grave. Is saying that he wants to give peace to the Chole, but he's killing the Chole. As far as we do up to this point, there's a man named Joseph. Right now, as we sit in chapel, 300,000 children are walking around with firearms on them, taking the lives of anybody that they can. Do you realize that this year there were more children killed in war than there were the soldiers that fought in them? And this is the, this is the world that, that Jesus is calling you to. It's not just within the confines of the church and the kingdom that we build. It's the broader kingdom of the world around us. Lamentations 1.16 says this, For these things I weep, my eyes run down with water, because far from me is a comforter, one who restores my soul. My children are desolate because the enemy has prevailed. I'm grateful that we have not had to grow up in a country. Some of you in here from Liberia, Angola, Uganda, there are a couple of places, Nigeria, Ubang, who's here, know that in your country, like in northern Nigeria, where Muslims are attacking Christians, understand the horrors of some of the things that are going on there. But you and I, we have no clue, no, no clue to this. And what God wants us to do is to enter ministry with our eyes wide open, friends, that we see the world globally and we have God's heart for it. I will never forget when uh, I went to Angola, Africa. Before there was Uganda, there was Angola. And Uganda, although it's experienced 17 to 20 plus years of civil war, Angola had 30 years of it. And it sufficiently wiped the nation clean. Uh, Landmines, and I went in and what appalled me was the fact that the national church believed that a child could not be saved until the age of 15. 
nor should they be baptized in water until the age of 15, nor could they, by any possibility of the imagination, be baptized in the Holy Spirit by the age of 15. And it's really rooted in Portuguese teaching and actually a mentality that says a child doesn't have really money to give to the church, especially in third world country, until they're 15. So why baptize them in water? A child can't get baptized in water unless they're saved. So why baptize them in water? Because they're not saved. And why declare, how could they be filled with the Holy Spirit? Because if they're not saved, baptized in water, then they shouldn't be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I came in and last minute, the gathering, the national pastors gathering, their general council, they had a speaker that was to come in from Brazil that canceled. And if there was any moment in my life I felt was the most significant moment in my life, it was this. And they asked me, they said, would you speak to our pastors in this country about what you do? And they said, what is it that you do do? And I said, I speak about kids. I speak about youth. And he goes, okay. And for the next week, I began to talk about why judges were a generation arose that knew not the Lord happened because they failed to do Deuteronomy. When you stand up, when you sit down, when you come in, when you go out, talk about these things with your children. And by the time we were done, there was a riot at the general council, the assemblies of God, because they said, we need to change our position on this. Friends, God may call you to speak to nations. You think that you're here by accident or you might have not much to offer. I say to you right now, you are probably the most significant individual in this room because God has you at the perfect place to use you. You know what? In my opinion, Joseph is probably one of the more significant people among you because he's already aiming at the right target audience. And we could stop there, but there's even more to this. With human trafficking, right now in the world... There are over 100 million children who are being used in sex trafficking among the world. Some estimate and say that that's a conservative figure, that there are close to 400 million of them, and it's growing because of the Internet. One million of them are being recruited on a daily basis. I'll never forget when I was in Newark, New Jersey, and was doing some ministry there and having a little girl come forward who was pregnant at age 11 with her father's baby. You don't have to go overseas to see these things, friends. And I remember we brought in my friend Fred Sanchez, who's now at uh, Faith Assembly in Orlando. He's about to do a church plan out of there. And they used to take in children for an organization called Heal the Children. You bring them in and you house them so that they can get an operation that they need. And he brought the child in. She was 11 years old. But by the time she was eight, her father, her aunts, her uncles, her cousins, and her own brothers had all had her multiple times. And I'll never forget when we were there and he walked into the other room and she's there for operation on a brain tumor, but the only life that she knew was one that offered yourself back to somebody because that's the way that you say thank you or that's the way that you you pay your debts. And he walks into the room and she pulled back her blanket and there she was, an 11-year-old girl that thought that she had to offer herself to her host. And I'll never forget how Fred and the whole family and we began to minister to her and talk to her and say, sweetheart, Jesus asks nothing of you. Some of you in this room, that's the world that you're going to go and minister to. Supposedly, one out of six people are victims of sexual abuse. It tells me there's a whole lot of hurt, not only in the world, but right in this room. People who are heroes to me are people like Beth and Dale Decker, who work in Calcutta, India, in a ministry called Operation Rescue. In India, Nepal is to us what India is to America. Uh, Nepal is to India what America is to there with poverty. And so they go up and they say, we'll take your kids, we'll teach them a trade, we'll, we'll, um, impact, we'll help them get out of poverty. And so the, what parent in a third world country wouldn't hand their child over to that? And so they're like, sure, take them. But what they don't know is, is they take them and they bring them and they begin to solicit them in human trafficking, turn them into to, to, uh, prostitutes. And what they do is, is they go into the, to, to, the, to the owners of these children and they whip out a checkbook from missions money that you and I give and they say, how much? And they're beginning to buy back these children. And they have an orphanage not of just kids who are lost and on the street, but children who are being sold to the highest bidder and now are being told that Jesus has bought you and you far beyond any price that this world could ever pay for you. This is the world that Jesus is calling you and I to, friends. I'm going to skip that last clip and just go to this final one and say this. Why, you know, this, this is heavy information. I don't, forgive me if I'm serving this if, on a paper plate to you, but it's, 
We need, as ministers of the gospel, to walk into ministry with our eyes wide open. 84% of those that come to Christ. The harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. There once was a man who had a sickle, and he sharpened it. He admired it. He went out and purchased a leather strap for the handle. He didn't stop there, but he showed it to all his friends. He became an expert at swinging it, but he never reaped the harvest. Then occasionally he'd go to a certain portion of the field and swing it and bring in the harvest, but he'd go back to sharpening it. He'd go back to putting decorations on it, showing it to his friends, but he only reaped a small part of the harvest. My friend, if 84% of the success rate of ministry exists within children, swing your sickle in that direction. Or if that is not your gifting, empower your church to hire somebody who is on fire for reaching the children, not only of our neighborhood, but of our world. I'd like to close with a video clip that would just not only open your eyes, but also open your heart. And then I'd like to come back and just share a few thoughts in closing.
worship team back. And I invite you to be part of the solution. I wish I could rip out my heart and slam it into your chest. I wish I could do that. But that really wouldn't be enough, would it? We have to get the heart of God. We need the heart of God on this. And that's what I pray that God will do in this moment. If you'd stand to your feet. You know why I do what I do? Because my childhood, my, my wife had a really wonderful childhood. My childhood, was, my childhood was horrific. It was marked by just about most forms of abuse that you could think of with the exception of incest. My parents loved me, but my mom, she was a, she was a whiskey drunk. And in the early parts of my, my years, she just, you wouldn't believe it if you saw her. And I was just thinking the other day, I, my, my wife and my kids were at the table and I walked in and my wife is just trying to get my son motivated for school and I freaked out. I freaked out. I'm like, I'm like, will you stop yelling at him? Will you just, I can't take it. I just, I flipped. Because I had a moment where I was that kid back in the corner rocking back and forth with my hands in my ears while I watched my mom knock my brother all over the place. You wouldn't believe it. My mom is a sweet woman and I love her and she loves me and she's a new creation in Christ, but that was my childhood. And I'll never forget right here at this very place, right here, I took all of my issues and I came forward and I began to name them by name and I began to name people and I said, God, I forgive this person. I forgive that person. You wanna talk about a dysfunctional home? There isn't a functional one that exists. We all come from dysfunction. But this is the truth I'll never forget that stands true and empowers me to do why I do what I do. It was this, when I was in one of Sister Joe's classes, she said to me this, she said, David went out to fight Goliath and afterwards he killed him. He took his own sword and cut his head off. But years later, when he was running from Saul, he had nowhere to go and he, was, he had no weapon and he comes to a place called Anathoth as he's about to disappear into the desert. And he says, I'm on the king's business. I have nothing to fight with. I need a weapon. And they said, oh, David, there's no weapon here except the sword of Goliath, whom you killed. He said, give it to me, for there's none like it in all the kingdom. Gang, the devil waves a sword in front of your face the way he did in front of Goliath, did in front of David. The weapon that the devil waves in your face to destroy you with God wants to put in your hand to fight the battle of the Lord. And I believe that maybe when David was king, he was dubbed with the sword of the giant that he killed. I don't know what your issue is. And you know what? You don't have to have an issue to be effective, but what I invite you to do is this, is that you would open your heart as we begin to praise and worship to say, God, not only my eyes, but open my heart to begin to see that I have been called to reach every other face in the world. And that if my vision doesn't encompass children, then I'm falling short of the mission that you have for my life. Father, in the name of Jesus, right here and right now, God, Lord, they don't need the heart of Paul. They don't need the heart of David. We need the heart of God. Father, would you open our heart, break our hearts with the thing that breaks your heart. Father, today, 100 million children are being sold into sexual trafficking, God. Lord, 400,000 children, 300,000 children are fighting wars and taking lives and will never see their 12th birthday because they're fighting a war they should never be fighting. God, today in this world, children wander the streets with no home, no direction, and no one telling them that Jesus loves them. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to be part of the solution. So here in this place, we create an altar and we give you our lives. Lord, it doesn't matter what we feel called to. It's what you call us to, God. And if that encompasses children, we say with Isaiah, God, here am I, Lord. Send me. Send me. In Jesus' name.